How's it going, everyone, and welcome to the Bot Podcast, where we interview movers, shakers, and innovators and talk all things conversational user interfaces. I'm your host, Chad Oda, and today we are very privileged to have Audrey Wu, the CEO and co-founder of Converge. Converge is an AI voice and messaging platform powering conversational experiences for brands and retailers such as Estee Lauder companies, Sephora, Proactive, Shopify, and the Grammys. Audrey previously was the head of studio at I Am Person and is a founding member of LA City of Angels Leadership Collective, as well as being an industry mentor at the UCLA Anderson School of Management. So with that, Audrey, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for that lengthy intro. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so before we get into more of like the chatbot and voice questions, I always like to ask like a rather unique question that's relevant to our speaker. Um, so I sort of looked at your background and you went from like investment banking, yeah. marketing to chatbots. And I think, you know, especially with conversational interfaces, I think there's such like a diverse, you know, sort of a mix up of different people's backgrounds coming from technology or coming from marketing. So, you know, for all the other like entrepreneurs and people that are looking to make the jump out there that maybe don't have a technical background, do you have any advice or tips on how you sort of made those jumps in your career? Um, well, one of the things I always do is I'm a lifelong learner. So a lot of the stuff I taught myself. So like I literally went on Udemy. I went on Coursera. I took classes. Um, this is such a new space that, you know, really nobody has the proper background to get into it. Um, I basically, you know, was lucky enough to have the opportunity to join um, in person um, when they first were part of the Disney Accelerator program in 2015. Mm -hmm. That's how I fell into um, this whole conversational space with chat bots. And at that point, we were still just, just doing bots. We were experimenting with voice. But uh, at that point, you know, it was just chat bots. And people didn't even know what they were. So it was, you know, I started doing this in about 2015. And there is no linear path. I mean, a lot of startup founders, you are going to find, used to be investment bankers, uh, just because we're gluttons for punishment. Um, and that's a common theme with a lot of VCs and all, a lot of the female founders that I know in the space. Um, I moved into marketing because I just got sick of numbers. But, you know, when you make these pivots, you just have to really educate yourself. Like, you have to get real smart on it. You got to hustle. Um, you got to bring in maybe some small customers at first that you can do freelance work with. Um, but it's a lot of work and it's a lot of hustle. And, um, you know, I've worked really, 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 really hard the past three years to just sort of even get to a position that we are now. And I still don't, I still don't think like, you know, I'm like, Oh, we only did these things, but you know, just hustle and learn. Absolutely. And I think that's like incredibly evident in the fact that, you know, number one, you're going to be speaking at South by Southwest. So congratulations. Oh, yeah. speaking spot. <laughs> We're all super excited to sort of see people at South by Southwest this upcoming year talk about conversational user interfaces. And number two, you know, I think most people are pretty familiar with the Sephora bot. And I think that's what your company was pretty instrumental in putting together. Um, so that's it's really cool to see all that stuff come together. Yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we started off just doing chat bots and, um, you know, my co-founder Liz, uh, Liz Snower actually was at Kick. And she was the one that built the H&M bot, um, the Sephora bot, and uh, the BS Pink bot. So she's probably one of the first conversational UX designers out there. And at that point, they didn't have a name for it. So they just called her, like, they gave her a random title, right? But um, it was like Solutions Lead or something like that. But that's basically what she was doing. And she, again, she's been, she was at Kick in 2015. So yeah. you know, we've been doing this for a while. And we've really seen a lot of changes, um, you know, there were a lot of interesting learnings to the first few years. It's still the wild, wild west. Oh, yeah. I mean, I like to, I like to akin it to like, you know, back when MySpace was big, right? Yeah. yeah. Everybody had to have one, but yep. like, you didn't exactly know what you were doing with it. And then you started right. throwing out plugins and it just got awful, right? So totally. that's kind of where I envision like bots are still right now. Yeah, absolutely. So I think maybe a point to that, since you guys have sort of seen like this like period over the last like several years, you know, all the way to the culmination of the Converge platform today, you know, for you guys, like, what is like the customer need? What's the specific market opportunity? And also what's the differential, right? We see a lot of platforms in the space and specifically, like, what is your secret sauce? Like, how are you guys positioning what you guys are doing? 
So I would be honest, like, you know, we all have platforms that deploy to multiple other platforms, you know, so I, I don't see like a huge distinction, perhaps. Yeah. I mean, the tech stack might be different, but we're all in essence kind of doing the same thing, um, just maybe in a different way. So, you know, if we learned earlier on that that wasn't really a huge differentiation in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, product. Uh, but one of the things that, you know, is a differentiator is being able to get customers onto your platform. And that's like the hardest part. Oh, yeah. That is a really hard part. Yeah. Absolutely. So would you say that maybe some of the secret sauce might come from the fact that you guys were, you know, maybe pioneer pioneering conversational UX, you know, because your co-founder had sort of the background coming from yeah. that. And I think that's a huge component that I think is sort of a void right now for a lot of people. It's just like, okay, we get the technology, you know, we understand NLP, we understand context and state management. But then like when it comes to like conversational UX, I feel yeah. like a lot of people are throwing stuff against the wall, but I feel like there's sort of a, you know, framework sort of emerging a little bit, but I think some people are better positioned than other people, depending on where they came from. So one of the interesting things that we did at in-person uh, when I built that to the U.S. office was we hired screenwriters. Mm. Uh, and I think that's pretty, pretty common that you're going to start seeing like a lot of people hire screenwriters to do this because it's obviously it's a bi-directional conversation, yeah. right? And if you have engineers doing it, it's going to be awful, right? Just because right. the creativity is not there. Sure. So hiring screenwriters was a way that when, when I was at in-person and we did the Miss Piggy bot or we did you know, the bot for Zootopia, uh, it was a way of there's personas, right? You're talking in a very specific kind of voice. And that requires writing talent. Yeah. And that's just simply not a skill everybody has. And also the ability to envision, you know, multiple paths. I mean, I think a lot of bots right now simply are decision trees. You know, they're yeah. if this and that, because that is the easiest way to start. But uh, when you kind of get, if you look at one of our uh, flows, you're going to lose it. It's just all over the place, right? Because it, it shouldn't be a linear path. It should yeah. be a choose your own adventure type of thing. So um, if you look at one of our lucid charts for a conversational flow, it's pretty complex and pretty, pretty long. So it's not just like a few little boxes and then the experience ends. So it, it requires quite a lot of thought. Yeah. And when you're thinking about it, you also have to think about the medium that you're building on. So if you're building a chatbot on Facebook Messenger, you know, you're sort of limited toward the features they give you. Yeah. and the templates and the lists and these things. So, you know, you can only work within that framework. And with voice, you know, there's only certain things we can do as well. I mean, it's not visual right now. Yeah, so yeah. the way we try to make it more personalized is, um, which actually the Grammy action, the new one's up now. Yeah. So if you have a, if you have a Google, say, hey, Google, talk to Grammy. Uh, one of the things we did that was very interesting for that project um, in terms of like conversational UX and personality was that we literally use sound files. So nice. the person talking to you is a sound file of a real person. I love and it. what we do is we block end uh, the voice files and then we put dynamic content in between, which can be updated. Now that dynamic content is going to come out in Google voice, yeah. but this is one of the tactics that we're sort of thinking about right now, like how to push this into the future. Because, you know, one of the things everyone tells you is that personality is really important, right? That's why Poncho was self popular because it was funny and cheeky and, you know, um, they had, comedy writers on their staff yeah. so you know you just think about the success stories of the best bots that are out there they're always ones that have some sort of personality uh some sort of differentiation that you know makes it a little bit more interesting than just um what we like to call mech bot uh yeah. which is the bot that is basically you throw up the same bot for everything yeah totally i couldn't agree more with that sentiment i, I think um you know just having really compelling compelling storytelling and personality is the difference, right? That likability. It's like, you know, if you want to get people onto a new modality, it's just like, do they enjoy the experience? Or is it just like something super stale? So I could not agree more with that sentiment. Mm -hmm. Sort of like maybe going back to the early days, you know, before you get into I'm, I am person. In person, yeah. Yes. Um, what was that jumping off point for you? Because like, you know, at that point, you know, like there wasn't too many people really making the jump into conversational user experiences. So what, what was that motivation? Yeah. You know, to be honest, uh, I was looking for a job at like a top startup, right? That was one of my things. It's like, I want to do something mm -hmm. really cool. I don't know what. And uh, at that point, I was looking at a couple of different opportunities. And yeah. this one just sounded like the coolest. It was like, I get to work at AI. What? 
Love it. Um, Love it. I'm taking I'm taking that job, you know, because I, you know, you got to do something that scares you. I literally yeah. had no clue. You know, I went on to Coursera and I took Andrew Ng's like, you know, machine learning class, which like halfway through, I was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> Math, right? No, no. I mean, it's just hard. And yeah, no, I agree. It's, it's not like, and it's not perfect by any means, you know, yeah. it's still very, very, very much being trained by humans. So the jumping point was just that it seemed like the most cool thing I could do. Like all the opportunities else I was given, they were all marketing opportunities. And I thought, yeah. well, that's interesting. I've done that. But this is like a marketing tool in some ways, but we don't really know what it does yet. It yes. just seems cool. Absolutely. So I honestly, I, ju I jumped in with like, I don't know what's going to happen, but let's try this out. No, I love it. Great answer. Great answer. I think that's a really cool way to jump into the space. And I think many people probably have similar stories as to how they ended up in this space of chatbots and voice. Um, so that being said, you know, sort of moving to present day here with Converge, you know, when you guys had started the platform, what were like some of the initial successes that you guys saw early on that were like, okay, I think, uh, I think we're moving in the right direction here. You know, this is working really good with this use case here. And in addition to that, if you can maybe talk about some of the specific use cases, whether it be e-commerce or sort of like brand bots or things of that nature. Yeah. So one of the first things we did as a team was that uh, we built a bot in partnership with Shopify. Mm. So what it was, was a marketplace bot um, that lived on Kick. Mm. And, um, you know, just because, you know, we had early relationships with Kick and, you know, obviously most people aren't really developing for Kick anymore because it's you know, kind of obscure at this point. But, um, you know, at that point, they had the bot shop that came out before Facebook Messengers, you know, a few weeks before. So they were always on head of the term in the bot space. And one of the things we learned with the Shopify bot was that people are actually really willing to buy things. It was really weird. I think we had, like, it basically, it was a quiz to help you determine to purchase a gift for yourself or for someone else. And, um, and it pulled product feeds up for specific Shopify stores that had signed on to use the app. And so it was pretty curated. And one of the things we saw was like 70% of the people finished the entire quiz flow. So that in itself was like, wait a second, you know, and I had known this through actually um, all the other bots we did as well, was that it was really surprising how much personal information you were able to get, what people were willing to share within a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So that I had already known. And those things Liz and I had already seen at our previous roles. Uh, what we were actually surprised with was that there was actually about two to, we did a white paper on this, by the way, so I can share that with you later. Uh, there was actually two to 3% conversion rate and an AOV of $25. And we were just like, hmm, that's interesting. Hmm. So that was kind of a, a neat little thing, little project that we worked on. Um, you know, we're not really actively, you know, basically maintaining this bot anymore, but I think for the first year for us, you know, it was pretty cool to kind of see the statistics and um, get the learnings really, really quickly. Yeah, no, I think that's incredible because I think, um, you know, it's just like this, interesting interaction between leveraging this messaging channel, which is sort of like underpriced attention right now, where it's just like, you know, we've had this penetration rate with like messaging across the board in the US, but marketers really had not migrated really too close to it. And now we have this like automation layer and we start seeing like, wow, open rates, click through rates, you know, like conversion rates, pretty high. So I think it's always yeah. cool to hear those initial stories. Um, but yeah, and I don't think it's really changed. The, the percentages yeah. that people are saying now are the same percentage as we said three years ago. So yeah. it really hasn't changed. Why, why do you think that is? Do you think it's just the fact that it's like, who knows, people are still... Yeah, it'll be interesting though, because I, I mean, I guess this is like always like something we always hear. It's like marketers and myself coming from a marketing background, we tend to screw mm -hmm. channels up. You know, because if you think about like the signal to noise ratio, it's just like with email right? The open rates are not that good, right? But is that a factor of marketers abusing the channel? And then similarly, when we look at messaging and chatbots that are being surfaced, is that something that's going to happen as well? Is this chatbot useful to me? Maybe that's why I look at it, right? I don't know. Um, if it's something I'm interested in, like, I really like the quartz bot. Yeah. I like it. I open it all the time. I love it because it's giving me content that I like and I find it useful. So, I mean, you could have a bot out there, but if the bot doesn't have a goal or it's not something that someone finds useful or interesting, it, it's probably not going to get the best open rate. But I think a lot of the use cases people are using right now are abandoned cart. Yep. And, um, you know, generally it seems like it's working pretty well. Um, it's not something we work in. So, you know, obviously I don't know their metrics, but from what I'm seeing is that it actually is working pretty well. 
Interesting. Yeah, the court spot is a really good one as far as like how they mm-hmm. do the job of just like mm-hmm. content that people actually want to look at. Um, and I think that's an interesting distinction to be made, to be made, like, especially today, right? It's just like, there are maybe a handful of like really good bots. And then there's like all these other bots that are like, eh, I don't yeah. know. But, you know, I think it's a function of time and just like experience and failures and successes and what we can learn from that. Um, so to that. Iter- iterating, 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 iterating. Yeah. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with that. So on the flip side of successes, also want to hear about any obstacles or challenges that you guys had faced going into the space as well. Um, I'd love to hear anything that you guys sort of saw and then figured out a solution to go around it. Uh, obstacles are really that, you know, this was so early, you know, yeah. it was very hard to sell and it was so early. I mean, now it's like chatbots a line item for the yeah. marketing department. Right. And that's like, okay, now it's just everybody sort of wants one or needs one. And versus like two years ago, it was like trying to convince people they needed one. And that made it a much harder sell than it is now. Uh, mm-hmm. Now we get a lot of, in, now we get a lot of inbound uh, just because it's something that people have as a line item. And, you know, in addition, you know, sort of the work we've done in the past. Uh, and so a lot of our work is mostly enterprise. Um, it is a lot harder to do enterprise. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Um, but it's very rewarding. Um, I think the initial challenges I said are sort of gone within chatbots. Um, mm-hmm. I'm sure the, why do I need one? Right. Um, yep. Our next challenge now is revolving around voice and there's a lot of unique things that are happening in that space right now. Yeah. So let's talk about those two things you just mentioned. I guess, first of all, you know, I guess just like the general knowledge of people from the mid-market and enterprise space, you know, do you have a good sense that they sort of understand the utility, you know, well enough where they're way more amenable to like have these conversations when you approach them and say, Hey, you know, like we're looking to, you know, see if you guys might be interested in integrating this into your, you know, digital transformation, right? Um, what do those conversations sort of look like today? You know, as far as like, um, yeah. Well, right now, the voice is very nascent. And the problem with a lot of the enterprise customers we work with, they're e So Amazon's really not the best place for them to live, mm-hmm. uh, just for various reasons. Um, there's no deep linking between the skill and being able to purchase something, right? You still have to exit the skill, and then you have to go and ask, you know, Alexa to add it to your cart. So it's kind of a very clunky experience, and uh, most retailers don't want to be on Amazon's world. So we find that everybody's sort of like more on tune with like, let's build on Google. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, one of the things people don't really always realize is that assistant is on like at least 500 million phones and you know, it all runs concurrently. You know, there's too many apps for Google right now, but you know, they, uh, Google is really where I think a lot of people are paying attention to just because of the SEO. Yeah. Uh, right now they're not charging for any keywords. So, mm-hmm. you know, we are encouraging brands to get on early, right? I yeah. think I made it just, I read, I just wrote an article for ad week about this. Um, and so, you know, there's all these predictions that 50% of search is going to take place via voice by 2020. And it's already take a lot of it is. And yeah. we're finding that the conversation is more revolved around Google because Google now has transactions enabled. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Google has some pretty cool features, uh, that we're already using. Um, being able to communicate between the device and assistant app. So you're able to kind of send, um, it's called surface switching. So let's say I'm, and I end, um, I'm with the Grammys, right? And this is one of the features we built in is like, would you like to be reminded next week of trivia? And the Grammy skill is a trivia skill because we did a few different skills for them last year. And this is the one that performed the best. So we put extra effort behind this because the usage was so high and the repeat users were so high. But at the end, there is a question like, hey, you know, do you want a reminder? And if it says yes, what it'll do is it'll ping your phone when then there's the next um, set of trivia ready. And you can play it through Assistant or you can do it through the device. So you're moving to, and you know, Alexa has this ability now too to do things through the app. However, uh, I feel it's so strange that a lot of brands, you know, are gravitating less toward Alexa, even though it has more market penetration and more to Google. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think the, the first concern you mentioned makes a lot of sense, right? It's like a lot of these other you know, e-commerce stores, you know, do they want Alexa or Amazon, you know, just like aggregating all their data, sales data, and then, you know, 
you know, opening up like maybe a private label and just competing directly with them. Right. So like I can, you know, sincerely understand that concern. Um, yeah, it is interesting, you know, watching Google begin to open up and, you know, they even went back and sort of refreshed their assistant sort of user experience. And they were saying, Hey, we'll let you get more visuals now because, you know, voice doesn't always lend itself to certain use cases as well as other use cases. Now mm -hmm. you're finally getting those iterations. So interesting to see that evolution, certainly. Yeah, so, I mean, we do like product recommendations for, you know, like your beauty brands, it gets shot to your phone, you actually can see photos. So it's like a chatbot experience with an assistant. Uh, I think what's gonna really change things is that, um, you know, Google Hub just came out, you know, a little bit behind the curve about, you know, eight months after Echo Show. But um, I think this is gonna change things quite a bit because now we're gonna have a visual medium. Yeah. So I think that the um, things are only gonna get cooler um, given what we can do. I mean, there's zero documentation on Google Hub right now. So <laughs> yeah. I don't know what they're gonna let us do, but I hope it's some cool stuff. Yeah, no, that's a, actually a really good point you're making about multimodality. Um, you know, I think it's certainly going to extend a lot of use cases we see today that are potentially muted. You know, for example, just e-commerce in general, right? I can buy, you know, if you don't have the, the show, right? You're just, you know, conversating via voice, right? And as a result of that, it's like, maybe I can buy like, commodity-based products like, you know, paper towels or soap. Yeah, like replenishment. Replenishment right. is fine because, yeah. you know, Amazon already knows like what I purchased, right. right? So it's like, they know the brand I like, but if I'm going to go buy a pair of black boots, like I'm not going to buy it without seeing it, you know? Right. Like, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, so that lends itself to another question that <clears throat> seen some polarization on both sides. Mm -hmm. Some like voice first and chatbot first purist that think all the interactions need to occur only through conversation. We shouldn't use like web views. We shouldn't take them off to another channel. What's your thoughts around that? Um, I think that it depends. I don't, I don't believe yeah. in just being on one channel. I, yeah. I think that um, I wouldn't put all my eggs in one thing because it really depends on the use case. You know, I mean, yes, we do a lot of voice work and that's because we're, we're really excited about it and it's what our customers are asking for. But, you know, we still do bot projects, right? We, we still have chat bots. And it all really, again, depends on the use case. It, sometimes it depends on how the campaign is going to tie in together. If it's, um, you know, is this a three-month marketing campaign? Is this an evergreen thing? Um, I honestly don't have strong opinions. I just think whatever makes the best user experience, whether it's chat or voice. Um, you know, I actually quite like the, um, the little um, basic messenger widget that you could put on the website, which... Uh, you know, we did and for the Grammys and it's actually pretty cool. Uh, a lot of people find it that way. So you're sort of s solving discoverability and yeah, yeah. purists are gonna be like, what's well, a web view, but I don't care. I got this person now talking to me and they didn't have to go to Facebook and try to figure out how the hell to talk to the spot because I already had a web view. So, okay, sorry, I'm getting my sink replaced right now. Um, so I don't really have this idea of being purist of, you know, any sort of yeah. No, I, I, I definitely share like a similar viewpoint as you, you know, I think it's really use case dependent and I think it actually improves the experience when you jump between channels, as long as it's aligned to the use case, because it's just like, you're right. I think messaging right now is a great way to maybe not solve discoverability, but, you know, like provide a channel to drive user discovery to know that this skill or, you know, this app on Google voice exists. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think, you know, I'm curious to hear your thoughts too. You know, when we think about obstacles at a 30,000 foot level within this ecosystem, mm -hmm. specifically with voice, discoverability is a huge problem right now. Mm -hmm. Like I think voice will continue to be an adjunct channel until someone solves that. Like, what do you, what do you see with that right now? So nascent, right? I mean, yeah. we're still experimenting a lot and, you know, we saw, yeah, again, it's hard to find, right? And it's even more challenging with Alexa because you have to, oh, she's going to talk to me. Um, you have to enable it um, versus Google. You don't have to enable the action. It's just inherently there. You just need to know it's there. So yeah. there are definitely some challenges. You know, we do partner with our customers in terms of sort of guiding them toward a marketing plan on what would be best. And there's a lot of experimentation that's still happening right now. Um, or there's just partnerships with the platform. Like last year, we were able to get a dedicated email for the Grammy trivia skill. You know, that was amazing because that just shot up like usage like crazy. So this is so early. I mean, paid media, I don't know. Does it work? 
I haven't really, you know, I haven't seen any actual statistics around it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I guess along the same sort of conversation topic of obstacles, um, what are like the top obstacles at a 30,000 foot level, you know, in addition to discoverability, it could be for chatbots, it could be for voice that you sort of see right now. It could be from like a hardware perspective or from an NLP perspective or UX perspective. I think that uh, AI, you know, is a major obstacle because most companies that say they're AI, they're not. Yeah. They're, they're not, right? And I think there's a very big misconception. Um, you know, we've had customers be like, well, why doesn't this AI work right away? And you're like, uh, it's not a <laughs> right? So I think there's still some education that needs to be done within that space. Um, you know, there was, there was an article in the New York Times uh, that came out about a week ago about sort of like these little AI factories in China where all these people do is just like identify images. So it's like, like hot dog, not hot dog, you know, like, <laughs> like basically that. So I think that's a huge obstacle because AI is just not there yet. It's not Westworld, right? It, yep. it, like sometimes people expect it to be and you're like, mm, you know, no, it's actually still really dumb right now. And I think that's one of the obstacles that, you know, we need to overcome. And as humans, you know, we have to continue programming the NLP or the AI just to improve it so that it really does eventually become something that understands us. You know, right now, yeah, you know, you can have some intent matching, you know, there's some basic things that you can do. But that, I think, is a huge hurdle. Um, if we can get that right, and I think it's going to take years, I mean, it's going to be creepy and amazing at the same time. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I certainly have seen that with like enterprise cases where it's just like, you know, it's like, oh, wait, we didn't know this was like human assisted, right? We actually have to train this. And even beyond training, it's like we have to have the data that sometimes doesn't even exist either, right? So it's like there are several obstacles, certainly just, you know, trying to implement something really simple too sometimes. Um, so yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think one of the other things that we're doing as developers is that, you know, we integrate into people's platforms, yeah. you know, into their CMSs. And so from a development perspective, that's also pretty hard. So not a lot of people have the resources to be able to integrate to Drupal, you know, yeah. which is something fun, right? And that's like, it's not easy. So that is another obstacle. Like, yeah, you can create, you can build something that's just a la top layer, but if you really want it deeply integrated into their brand's ecosystem on the digital side, the integration has to happen. And that I think is one of the most difficult technical challenges yeah. because you know, it is not something you can just turn on and all of a sudden it integrates with the CMS. It doesn't. You have, it's hard. It's a lot of work. It takes a long time. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that's something, you know, as, you know, time goes on, I think we're beginning to see more consolidated platforms and more sort of integrations that are baked into these platforms, you know, mm -hmm. the incumbent technology players like Oracle mm -hmm. or Person or Microsoft. You know, it's a function of time right now, but you know, for people like us, like we got to be in the trenches, we got to be building mm -hmm. integrations that sometimes aren't the most scalable, but you know, it, uh, you know, we're definitely getting to a place hopefully where all these things will be more accessible, but uh, mm -hmm. just a matter of time, right? Like you said, it's very nascent, mm -hmm. still, so still going mm -hmm. to that. So to that point, um, question in regards to, have you ever used a very good conversational experience that you legitimately, genuinely liked? It could be one of your own, right? Or it could be another one. That I'm, I'm going to say, and this is kind of a controversial thought. Um, yeah. I thought Tay was really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, it was messed up, but yeah, sure. I, 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 you know, I chatted with her a lot, right? Like yeah. when all that stuff happened, I'm like, wow, this is really, really, this is machine learning gone wrong. But yeah. it's what happens when it's unsupervised learning, yes. right? So you know, everything everyone else is doing is supervised because when it's unsupervised, that kind of crazy stuff happens. But I found it very interesting, right? I yeah. found that, you know, this is really bonkers. And like, you know, I've met Lily Chang and she's amazing, right? Oh, yeah. And I, I, still, I still just like, you know, every time I see her. Yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, as controversial as that was, I actually thought that was a very, very, very interesting thought. Um, nobody else has done anything else like it for obvious reasons. But, yeah, um. I think, yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, I, I really think it was interesting because they're like pushing the boundaries on natural language generation. Like these things are possible, but I don't think it's commercially viable yet. And I think there are significant steps that need to occur to make sure stuff like that doesn't happen. And um, that's really funny. So we actually had Lily Chang speak at our meetup. Yeah. Thing oh. he said was, uh, 
the first thing she's brought up was the Tay thing. She knew people were going to ask questions about that. Yeah. I think also the interesting thing is not only Tay, but also Xiao Ice, which they've been really pushing in China. It's like one of the most successful bots, you know, so I think a lot of their learnings, you know, for, for them going out on an edge like that, it certainly has circulated into their product development. So, you know, yeah, absolutely. And they have, they have Zoe now, you know, who oh, yeah, the that's right. Zoe. Okay, you know, the nicer, yeah, not the crazy, not the crazy the nice sister. Version. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but honestly, I think that was a great experiment. It was super interesting. I'm, you know, uh, I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> <laughs> other, other companies now are like, oh, I don't know if we should test this unsupervised, you know. <laughs> no. Yeah. Probably, <laughs> probably no. not a good idea. Probably not a good no. idea. <laughs> so, so I think uh, a segue from this, like maybe looking into the future, right? We're present state here. Things are nascent. Things are rather immature. People are still learning. Um, but looking, you know, maybe five years, two years out, you know, like what's your like idealized vision of like how this sort of comes together? You know, it could just be one you know, interaction at a store or, you know, what, what do you think? I don't think the platforms are ever going to play nice with each other. Yeah. They're just, they're just not right. People are like, Oh, can we do the same thing on every single platform? And it's like, well, the code base is completely different. Um, you know, they purposely kind of make you choose a side. So I don't see any sort of continuation between platforms just because mm. like Facebook has a portal, you know, they're all trying to compete. Apple's got whatever, they're so late in the game. Um, I don't even know what they have, right? The speaker. Um, Siri was terrible. Um, yeah. But they're never going to play well with each other. Yeah. It, it just, it's just you've got to choose. It's like, you know, are you Windows or are you Mac? And that's exactly how different Alexa and Google are. And, you know, Facebook's a whole different story. It's a whole different kind of bot. Um, Kick is a whole different code base. It's very yeah. different. They're all, they're all different. So... That is something that I don't, I think there'll be continuation of experiences within one platform. And I think that's what they're trying to get at with the hub devices or the portal devices, the show is that sort of visual audio and also text, right? It kind of follows you everywhere, but I don't think it's going to happen across platforms. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, something I've always speculated about too, whether or not we'll see, you know, um, cross ecosystem interoperability, you know, it'd be nice, but, you know, and I think also we're beginning to see, you know, not only, you know, the developers taking sides, but also the different companies, right? You know, we see mm -hmm. Facebook doing partnerships with Amazon Alexa now, and we see Microsoft mm -hmm. doing partnerships with Amazon Alexa now. So to me, it almost seems like, you know, Facebook and Microsoft do not want to get in the hardware game. They realize that Amazon is building out that channel from scratch. And then on the other side, we have Google, who's sort of their own entity over there. But I, I don't know. That's just... I, I, I don't think Facebook and Alexa are necessarily playing well with each other. I mean, mm. there might be some you know, integrations like tokens, maybe. I, I don't know yeah. much about that, to be honest. Yeah. But you know, with Portal, Facebook was making a statement. Yeah. You know, in fact, uh, F8 um, this year, uh, I remember... I, rumblings were that uh, they were going to give out the portal, right? Because they always give out a really nice gift. And yeah, yeah. because the whole Cambridge Analytica scandal sure. was not a good idea. So we all got Oculuses, which is still pretty cool. Yeah, but right. they're, they're cool. Making, I mean, but Facebook runs on advertising. You yeah. know, it runs on versions. You, you, I don't think they're going to play well with Alexa. They've, they've got a whole different plan. I mean, they got bigger problems right now. So like, who knows what's going to happen. Um, but I just don't. I mean, though we just did get an email saying that Apple is now working with Kick, so there's some sort of I don't even really know what's going on. Yeah, there, there's something interesting. Going on. Yeah, no, yeah. It's, you're right. It's the wild, wild west right now. Anything can happen still, right? But I think at the same time, it's like, you know, it's early stages, and we can sort of take parallels to the early days of you know websites or the early days of mobile, right? It's like. People get so enamored with the technology, but it's just like, remember, remember guys, there's use cases that have to generate mm -hmm. something. Why? And I feel like we're finally brushing up into that point where it's like, okay, it's not shiny object stuff anymore. What's the return on this here? But yeah, it is. I mean, I was, I was one of the early people in uh, mobile websites. Back then mm. they were movie sites. Mm. Uh, <laughs> basically just little tiny websites on your phone, right? There were no apps back then. So I've really seen how that's grown quite a bit um, from, you know, kind of like us building stuff. And I remember um, I was at a company called Icon Mobile and I was just thinking to myself and kind of how I got into marketing was like, 
who's using this? <laughs> How are you guys promoting this? How are you getting people to it? And you know, we were just mostly a dev shop, so we didn't care. But that's one of the reasons why I was like, you know what, I think I want to move into marketing because I see these products and they're really cool, but if no one's using them, what's the point of them being out there? So I got really interested in marketing after that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's like a major thing right now. You know, it's like, how do we, how do we articulate these experiences and have that message resonate with brands that, you know, are looking for something like this? And I think, you know, that's always difficult, especially like with emergent technologies. I'm just curious, like, how do you guys sort of, you know, articulate the value of conversational user experiences to your customers? So one of the interesting things for us is most of our work is inbound at this mm. point. Um, we do go out obviously and chase some brands as well, but uh, for the most part, you know, right now companies are getting real smart. So they're basically reaching out to, you know, providers and, um, you know, basically having us do our RFP process, which is what yeah. you do with a large company, mm -hmm. right? And um, at this point, they're already pretty well educated in the space, right? They know what they want, but they may not know what's actually possible. So as developers, we have to be the ones to educate them in terms of, you know, new features and what we can do, uh, you know, to do that. Um, so for me, it's a little bit of a different, I mean, we do chase down people who are just like, we're just not ready. And that's fine. You know, and we want to yeah. chat on step. Okay, cool. But I don't think the values now something you really need to harp on so much. Uh, I don't know if you remember that BI slide that everybody and their mother was using, like in terms of like more people are on messaging. Than yeah, 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 yeah. Social media messaging is superseded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's hysterical. Liz and I were comparing decks in the early days. We're like, oh my God. And then we looked at everyone else's decks. We're like, we all have that crappy BI slide. Um, that's like fact now, right? It's a fact. Yeah, so yeah. it's not something you need to include. Um, these things that we had to fight for and really like try to convince people of uh, a couple of years ago, you know, when I was in, in person, you know, it was a hard sell. I mean, going in and like a lot of it was just education. Like I did, yeah. I do a lot of speaking, right? Because uh, people need to be educated in the space. And now I think that there's a lot more articles, like, you know, the New York Times just wrote one saying, your yeah. brand needs to be on the place. You know, where this is a mass adoption that people are starting to read and understand. And so it's more almost like, oh, no, we need a strategy. Shit, you know, yeah, yeah. but it's so complicated. Let's go find someone to do it. Um, I feel like a lot of it's a little bit more, um, you know, it's just more brands are more innovative, you know, who yeah. are really thinking about that. We've always been a little bit more innovative. Mm -hmm. Who will approach this? I mean, we get some companies are just like, oh, well, you know, we're kind of old timey. We don't want to be first. And then you have people like, well, no, we want to be the first, right? So you kind of have a little bit of both. And you know, the customers we do have right now, we haven't really had to convince because yeah. they they wanted to have this. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think that's always like the opportunity in like you know white space you know, you know, opportunities. It's just like, just find the people that are going to be like the enthusiasts and jump on this first. Right? Don't worry about mm -hmm. people that are going to be at the end of the long tail adoption. So, you know, it makes complete. I don't know. Who knows where this is going to go? I have no idea. I can't predict the future, right? I mean, if you told me a year ago, I'd be doing voice. I'd be like, what? I love it. You know, and, Pragmatic and like, last, on all this. Yeah. I learned how to use dialogue flow. Yes. Last year. I love it. Love it. I had to. I had to. We had like yeah. so much work and I had a code, you know, like yeah. if you told me I would be coding in dialogue flow, I'd be like, oh, what? You know, so I, I think that's what makes this space so interesting. I know one yeah. of the questions you had, like, what keeps you inspired? Keeps you inspired is like every day is something different. Um, you know, every like week, every month, you know, something new comes out, a new feature, a new thing we can do. Uh, you know, so it's to me, it's super, super exciting. Um, I don't think it's going to go away and it's just really cool to see how this industry has grown. And I don't think you thought you'd be doing this either probably a year or two ago, right? Would I be working in chatbots? No, but obviously, you know, you find something very interesting about it and that's, you're very passionate about it as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I love it. Um, yeah. I think a lot of people stumble into this space and then they realize like, this is actually the cutting edge, right? It's like a paradigm shift is occurring right now. And I, I think a lot of people like get too far into the weeds, but when we look back like 30,000 feet, it's like literally we're at a point where like humans 
stop trying to figure out the best way to interact with computer systems and computers, maybe not the smartest, but begin to understand us a little bit. And I think that's incredibly powerful where, you know, a 10 year old and a 70 year old can both. Yes, I use the same story. Yes. Similar experience. I love it. Yeah. It's super. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're training us on how to use it. So yeah. we're being trained on how to talk to a device. It's not the other way around. You know, I mean, a little bit it is, but like yeah. we're being trained how to use it. And that's 10 year old all the way down to like five-year-olds at this point yeah, it's crazy. to seven-year-olds. It's a multi-generational thing. My parents love that thing because there's no buttons. You yeah. know, they, mm. I bought them an Alexa and they just love it. Except my dad like tells her she's stupid all the time, but um, <laughs> I don't think she appreciates that. But you know, on the other sense, it's like, like, you know, how kids now that are probably what, 10, 11 have never grown up without an iPad. Yeah. Like, they don't understand. The screen that you can't touch the screen, you know, so you're right. It's total paradigm shift. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the exciting thing about it. So, you know, maybe getting back to present day a little bit, um, mm -hmm. do you have best practices that you would like to share in regards to hardware development, UX? Always interesting to hear what people have learned. I'm happy to maybe discuss some tools that I think could be really helpful. Um, some of the things that we use, um, we use Bot Society. Mm -hmm. for mock-ups, right? So, so if you want to do a conversational design, that's the best place to do it because if you're going to do something, don't do it on chat fuel. It's just too hard. Do, do the conversational flow first, right? Uh, that you should be your first. You should really be able to figure out what the goal of the bot is. So I recommend using something like Bot Society. Um, you know, we've been using it since the early days. It's, it's a pretty cool tool. Uh, there's no coding. So anybody can go in and jump in and do that. Um, I think that, you know, chat field with mini chat, any of these guys are great if you're just beginning. Um, but again, I do suggest that you get the conversational flow right first before you start building. And I think these are really good entry points, right? To start learning about how to use these things before you start thinking about how you're going to build your own platform. Like play around, see what you can do, see what other people can do. And, you know, for our end also is that, you know, we always tra track analytics. And with that, we actually partner with Dashbot. Okay. Um, because you know, why recreate something that someone else is doing better? So, and also the team there is awesome. So, you know, really, really like the founding team. Uh, so yeah, I, I think in terms of tools, you know, those would be good. Um, Amir Shavat, when he was still in bots, uh, wrote a book called uh, designing bots that yes, I think is I have that book on my shelf. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, he's at Twitch now, so he's completely pivoted, but, um, you know, a couple of the bots that, you know, my co-founders built. I've been used as case studies in there. And um, I think that that's really the only book out there right now. I mean, there's just not much, right? You can Google stuff, you can find articles that people have written, but there's really no Bible of bot yeah. design. Um, it, there's no playbook. You know, it's just not there yet. And I think we're all sort of experimenting and trying to do different things. And it's hard to say. I mean, other than that, that's the only book I know of. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I literally, you know, when I was looking on Amazon, it's like, okay, there's that book. And then there's another like voice user experience book. And then I see nothing else. So yeah, there's not much out there. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, keep testing stuff, throw stuff at the wall, see what sticks, you know, if it doesn't, all right, change your strategy, right? Not yeah, much. yeah, absolutely. And obviously yeah, it's just about educating yourself. You just said educate yourself. How does this thing work? You know, like before you go out and like, I'm just a company and build this platform, like figure this shit out first. Like, yes. just play around. Like, I love it. Figure this shit out. By Audrey Wu. <laughs> figure that shit out first. Great quote. Um, so, <laughs> here you go. You know, I want to give you the stage. You know, let people know where they can find you talk or let people know what sort of stuff is going on with the company or what sort of features they can expect. Um, right now, we're moving toward um, something that is going to be a completely platform agnostic voice product. Um, so I'm not like we're not fully into market yet, but uh, just based upon our learnings with working on Alexa and Google and the constraints and the bugs, uh, you know, and discoverability issues, as we talked about, uh, we're working on a new product called Speakeasy, uh, which is basically a voice product that lives on your website or mobile app. So you don't even have to look for it. It's right there. So that's one of the things that, you know, we're thinking about in terms of the future is just going completely platformless. Um, not to say that we're not going to continue building with our partners. We still will. But, um, you know, we're kind of experimenting a lot right now. And this, we don't know if it's going to work, but we also know, like, a lot of the touch points that we talked about earlier, the data, the discoverability, uh, these things are usually, they're kind of solved, you yeah. know. But uh, we're, we're working hard on that, hopefully having a pilot out pretty soon. Um, I just, 
you know, we're a small team, so it's a lot of work. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Well, I can't wait to use Speakeasy in a Speakeasy, hopefully, to order yeah, I know. in the future. I love the name. Um, but, you know, at that note, Audrey, you know, it was really great to talk to you and learn yeah. from your insights. Um, you know, uh, if people are looking to check you out, I know you'll be at Business of Bots in February and then at yeah. South Southwest. Are you going to be speaking at any other conferences? Uh, I can't think about it right now. I, I think those are the only two I have on top right now. Sure. Um, I'm usually around, but you can always tweet me at Mr. Audrey Wu. Uh, I like to be on Twitter. So you can always reach out to me that way. It's probably the best way to get to me. Cool. Sounds good. Hey, Audrey, thank you. So thank much. you. Thank you, Chad. Bye. Bye.